This is Ian Morris for Light Reading with Orb TV, and I'm joined today by Jason Hoffman of Mobile Objects. Jason, thank you, thank you for joining us. Yeah, thank you for having um, me. You, you, you're at a very new company uh, in Mobile Objects. Can mm. you just give us a bit of background on uh, and what it is exactly what you're doing there, and, and, mm. and what sort of prompted uh, the, the, the establishment of that of that firm? Yeah, so I, we're uh, you know technically a, a, a spin out of Deutsche Telekom, so yeah. we're a wholly owned subsidiary of Deutsche Telekom that's focused on uh, edge computing. Uh, but in particular, uh, our focus is on developer-facing edge services that help new developers on new devices with new use cases and that, that type of work, uh, as well as the required infrastructure transformations needed to deploy edge. Okay. And uh, what, what sort of prompted the move? I mean, uh, edge computing's been around for a while and Deutsche Telekom has obviously been looking at this as, as well as other, other operators have. It's quite an unusual thing for a, an operator, it seems, to create a, a spin-off, a startup, yeah. um, which is wholly owned, rather than rather than doing the work uh, internally. What, 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 what sort of behind well, the decision? Well, I think, I think uh, Deutsche Telekom has a pretty good history of that. Right. I mean, in the sense of, uh, uh, you know, each, each, each country is sort of naturally a spin-off or a separate company under a sort of larger umbrella, you know, yeah. from that, that point of view. Uh, I mean, I think there's high tens of companies within that group, you okay. know, around there. So, uh, you know, so for me, one thing that was attractive was that it wasn't new for them. Yeah. You know, the, this action of doing that. Uh, I mean, the reality is that very often when you want to do a new effort and really have a focus on it, it is a good idea to do it as a standalone entity with its own set of metrics and, and yeah. those types of things. Uh, now, as far as the timing around edge computing, you know, I mean, the, the, the reality is we've had uh, two parts of the infrastructure undergo a pretty dramatic industrialization over the last 10 years. Uh, on, on, on one side in the telecom space, it was largely uh, RAN, you know, in the case of LTE. I mean, when you really look at, you know, how LTE had to happen to support things like the iPhone and so on like that, uh, you had... Um, things that really fit almost hyperscale definitions of a very distributed infrastructure and the like. Yep. On the complete opposite end of the infrastructure, um, you've had all the hyperscale cloud providers emerge. Right? Now the reality is when you look at that infrastructure that's in between those two, um, that also has to undergo a pretty dramatic you know, industrialization effort too. Um, but we're starting to sit down almost from a developer standpoint and say, well, there's the internet, and there's mobile networks, and mobile networks are not the internet. Uh, and uh, all these capabilities exist, you know, in the normal sort of internet world that don't actually exist entirely on the mobile networking side. Yeah. Uh, but if they did, uh, then there's a lot of interesting things we could do. You know, um, I mean, the truth is, is when you look at um, uh, not not just the devices that exist today and interesting applications you could do for them, but all the devices that don't exist mm -hmm. uh, because of uh, you know, either the economics of the device or you know, the capabilities of, of mobile networks. Uh, uh, you look at the emergence of all the sort of AR type use cases, VR type use cases, always on type use cases and the like. Uh, you know, the truth is, is that everything basically in the mobile networking world's gotta have a full set of capabilities to really do those applications. So I, I guess with edge computing, we're talking about moving, essentially talking about moving those IT resources out much further to the, the edge of the network, closer to the end user, mm. um, which is a, an investment that operators have to make. Where does mobile edge fit in exactly? Is it the uh, software? No, that but, I, but I think we, we have, there's a lot of, uh, there, there's almost a, for some reason, there's almost an over obsession of where and what for yeah. edge computing, mm -hmm. right? Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, the, the, the truth is, is when you look at the collection of smartphones in the world, it adds up to a lot of CPUs. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, you know, when you look at a bunch of the infrastructure that's in between, it adds up to a bunch of infrastructure. And you look at public clouds, you know, the big public clouds. I don't think it's so much about one thing turning into another or shifting to another or workload sort of moving out, you know, in that. Um, you know, the truth is, is if you had things like um, um, anybody that's doing a... a, a an application on a smartphone today, mm -hmm. uh, you know, if you're if you're doing location services on the smartphone, uh, it, it it's what dramatically drains the battery life. Yeah. Now the only reason you're doing locations on the smartphone is because there's not an edge service available to you that tells you very precise and accurate location. 
you know, so, so I mean, not, not the way the sort of location services has been done in telecom before, but like a uniform way of doing that. Um, so even when you look at very simple things that could be presented out to developers, mm -hmm. you know, in the case of, of mobile networks, um, these can have dramatic impacts on battery performance of the device and a whole number of things. So, so I think you know a lot of those operational services, as well as 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 as, as others, is um, you know it's, it's it's time to do them. Yeah. And what what are the big sort of challenges in in, in the uh, edge computing area that you you specifically looking to address at, at Mobile Edge X? Uh, well, uh, you know in the telecom space we're traditionally uh, not um, as good as we could be at, at developer facing things. Yeah. Right. Okay. Uh, and um, <clears throat> I think one reason why we've wanted to do this as a separate company too is, uh, you know, in given markets, all the operators are going to have to work together, you know, to sort of present a given view to, to mm -hmm. that. Uh, you know, do, doing that as a standalone company is easier than doing it as a part of one of the competitors in a market. Yeah. Right. Uh, but um, but I, I think it's, it's, it's really going through... Uh, you know, as we've sat there and been working with a lot of, you know, current, uh, you know, mobile gaming developers, you know, AR, VR, a lot of people working on new devices, you know, the sort of security cameras, you know, we've gone through a lot of these. We have a, a set of pretty common requests from them that said, well, you know, it'd be really great if, you know, I could get this. It'd be really great if I could sort of have this type of information. It'd be really great if, you know, okay. I could do that. Uh, and uh, you know we're trying to uh, be that company that is taking a lot of the great aspects of mobile networks, but actually getting rid of you know actually making them transparent to developers and actually creating those types of developer-focused services. Okay, and and I think Deutsche Telekom is also talking about potentially bringing other operators in as well, and and, mm -hmm. and have, having those involved in in, in mobile EJX. Is that yeah. something that's already started to happen? Uh, those conversations. Yeah, yeah, we've we've had those conversations. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and it, it, that's. Uh, aimed at just sort of creating more momentum for edge computing, I guess, with uh, ha having a, a, a bunch of operators working together, I guess, makes it easier to, to kind yeah, of come up I with mean, common it's, standards. It's, and it's, uh, operators work very well together when they're working indirectly, yeah. <laughs> like I guess you yeah. could say. Uh, and, that's, and there's plenty of historical examples of that, uh, you know, in that, um, uh, you know, we're, hel we're here to help the whole community. Yeah. Execute well in edge. How, how important is it in the context of five G? I mean, low latency services and edge computing often gets talked about when. Uh, when people yeah, but, talk but about you have you have really simple things, and that that is like every every five G vendor. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the whole architecture of five G is disaggregated hardware and software, and every vendor, for example, is standardized. You know, their five G software is really a set of microservices running on Kubernetes. Yeah. Uh, so you know every vendor in the space has picked a distributed container platform, okay. you know, to deploy literally all the five G software in. Yeah, yeah. So just the transition to five G means that uh, you know the millions of base stations in the world are going to be talking to Kubernetes clusters. So what else should we be doing with those? Yeah. I mean, you know, the idea that all we're doing is running radio control software in there mm -hmm. is probably not not quite right. Yeah. You know, but if you just stop and you think about that, that that there are um, going to be uh, tens to hundreds of millions of small cells, talking to tens of millions of macro cells, talking to hundreds of thousands of aggregation sites, talking to uh, thousands of regional data centers, talking to uh, tens of thousands of regional data centers, talking to thousands of national data centers. Uh, from that perspective, and that whole sort of like topology that's that's in there, and then even at the very furthest edge, I mean, if we're if we're trusting. Uh, container platforms like Kubernetes to run 5G control systems. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, then we start having some really interesting deployable spots inside of telecom to put new ideas in. Okay, how, how quickly do you see this sort of taking off with uh, more talk about 5G now? And that's obviously one of the big themes of this show. But is that is that really going to kind of give the push to edge computing in some of the use cases that you're, that you're looking at? Yeah, because I think it's going to be a, it's going to be a. Um, uh, I mean, the other big conversation people have here is, is just the business case for 5G. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, a business, I think a business case for 5G requires edge. Yeah. 
I mean, if there's well, it's almost that the low latency stuff seems to be the real the real difference, really. With well, not even and not even not necessarily just low latency, but even known latencies. Yeah. You know, yeah. we're we're not going to if you look at an autonomous car going up a road, there's no way that any operator can guarantee like one millisecond continuous latency on the whole road. It doesn't work that way. But yeah. But what we could do is actually expose known latencies to people. You know, so you know, here's where the base stations are and what the topologies are. When you're at this point of the road, you'll probably be at 28 milliseconds and it'll go down to four, then back up to eight, then you're going to hand over again. And right. you know, those developers there don't even know that information to even be able to do that type of work on the car. Yeah. Right. So so, so I so this is using all sorts of street furniture potentially. Is yeah, so a lot of it a lot of it's just known latencies. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I mean low latencies are you know, 5 G is just sitting there and saying that access latencies are going to get down to a millisecond. Yeah. Okay, they're going to get down to a millisecond. And, and there's a lot of things that would be really interesting to do if the entire cycle of doing it could be less than 100 milliseconds, mm -hmm. uh, you know, in total. Uh, and, um, and uh, okay, so access time is probably not going to be the limiting factor anymore. Okay. I and mean, that's really what 5 G is going to be. Yeah. But it's only going to go down to about a millisecond. Um, uh, you know, in comparison, for example, an L2 network inside of a data center is high hundreds of nanoseconds. Uh, you know, somebody like NASDAQ tries to do trading at about 22 to 28 microseconds uh, in there. So those are low latency. Yeah. You know, and if you get up to things where you want to be a thousand microseconds, that's a millisecond. So, you know, and, and it's just been that uh, connectivity times in the sort of pre-5G world have been the rate limiting thing. Yeah. And now in 5G, they're not going to be the rate limiting thing, you know, for many of these use cases. But but we'll see we'll see what 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 happens. Um, but latency is one part of it. The, the other big part of it, though, is that when you actually have those known latencies, then you can reliably offload uh, compute and data from the device. Mm -hmm. So you can you can start having uh, devices where you're not doing battery intensive location services. We can do them with like the new 5G location services. Uh, you know, you're we're able to sit down and just like how you do virtual desktop delivery, you can do virtual Android delivery to a smaller footprint, you know, type of device. Okay. Uh, you know, so we, we can start doing things from an edge service perspective that will allow devices to either be uh, longer life from a battery perspective, to be significantly like smaller, different form factors, cheaper. You know, you know, if, and if you can, if you can take, um, you know, a, a, a three thousand you know dollar type you know AR headset, make it a three hundred dollar AR headset. Uh, you know that, that that has a big impact on the space. Maybe just one last question. I mean, when when do, when do we see some of these applications appearing at the trial stage, perhaps, or you know, certainly sort of commercial, commercial uh, side fully? Well, I mean, we've been doing we've been doing uh, trials with developers already in, in in Germany. I mean, we have we have several locations up and running. Yeah. Uh, and uh, you know the the intention is in Q3 and Q4 this year as we continue to come out with new ones. Uh, I mean a lot of these, you know, a lot of these are um, uh, simple but powerful. Mm -hmm. I mean we have to remember that even even something like Amazon Web Services uh, started with uh, a developer payment API that was four API calls, and then a two API call messaging queue system, and then a th three API call object store and then, yeah. you know, a compute service that was really just batch compute on the object store and yeah. the documentation for the whole thing was a couple of pages, yeah. right? <laughs> uh, and uh, there, there's, a, there's a lot of things we have when we talk to uh, developers interested in these where they go, well, you know, look, if, 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 if I could just know these two things and influence this one thing, meaning if I could do two get requests on an API and a post, I'd be pretty happy, and it would have this much value for me. And there's a bunch of people like that. Uh, we just want to launch those, yeah. you know. And the, and those can be, um, you know, some, sometimes uh, we, we just haven't done it because we didn't know. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so so I think we're we're trying to get on that type of cadence where, you know, if we come up with something like that, launch it. Okay. Well, look look out for it later in the year. But uh, thanks thanks very much for joining me, Jason. No, no, thank you for having me. Ian Morris with Light Reading for All TV.